Everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. I felt a great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, like a job for me. <laughs> Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Ah, welcome to the Old is New Again. We're here, part two, with Paul Dooley. You know him from 16 Candles as the dad, Runaway Bride. You know him from Popeye and uh, Slapshot a little bit there, Breaking Away the Dad there. He's been Sarge in Cars 1, 2, and 3. And last week we were talking about Christopher Guest and being an improv artist, if you will, on film. So let's continue with that with Paul Dooley. Everyone in Chris Guest movies pretty generally could improvise. Maybe one or two of them might just be regular actors. Right. But, of course, uh, he's a comic genius. I met him when he was 17. Uh, his mother was an agent, and she was my agent. She had been recommended uh, to me by Alan Arkin. And he was 17. I met him. We did a little improvisational show for PBS, uh, a lot of the improvisers together, and he had a small part in it, had a guitar, played right. a few... I played a few uh, uh, areas uh, where he played his guitar, and a few lines here and there, but it was a small part. But I knew then he had a big talent. Here's a bit of trivia. He has a one-day part, as I do. If I had a two-day part, he had a one-day part in the first Death Wish. Huh. And his mother is a casting director, so she cast me, her, her, her uh, client, and her son. <laughs> and he has a nice little moment in Death Wish, the first one. And then before he's a genius. He's an incredible comic genius. How do you compare his work with Larry David in respect to how they worked? Is it the same kind of thing? Here's a general idea of the scene, and then let's dive into it and see what you do? Or how does that work? Because it's, it's different. From what I understand, what do I know? I'm the outside looking in. It, it, this is not the usual norm with the way they produce their work as opposed to scripted television and, and movies. The difference is that... Uh, 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 Chris is a, an actually a great actor. When you think of his Corky St. Clair and right. Guffman, it was a brilliant characterization. Uh, uh, Larry is not so much a, perform a, a real actor. Right. He's a guy who plays himself. And right. although he was a stand-up briefly, he was always unsuccessful. They hired him <laughs> to write on uh, SNL and never used any of his stuff. Right. A funny story was he got sick of not ever having his stuff put on the air after week after week. And finally, he just went into the boss and quit. Lauren, Mike, Lauren, uh, My, uh, uh, Lauren Michaels, is it? Right. yeah, yeah. And uh, he went home, and his friends said, "What are you crazy? You get a big salary and really forget that they don't use your material. You're, what else are you going to do? What was? Uh, how can I make up for it?" They said, "Go back on Monday and pretend it never happened." And that's <laughs> what it <they> did. <laughs> and P.S. Of course, they, they did that on Seinfeld. I'm sure he wrote that episode. You know, <laughs> and George did the same exact thing. Uh, uh, he was brilliant with those. The writing in, in uh, Seinfeld was, it was certainly it was, uh, Jerry too, but Jerry would be too busy rehearsing five days a week and shooting to write too much, but he was always, uh, had a hand in all of it. But they were really, uh, the head, head writer, of course, was uh, Larry David, and, and those shows were brilliant. I'm watching the reruns for the third time, and they still hold up. They're just fantastic. They do. Those four actors, they were all like kind of comic geniuses. Yes. Julia and, uh, and um, George Costanza, you know, they were just fabulous. What I say about art, what I say about uh, uh, Larry David and his improvising is his way is a little different from Chris Guest. You're allowed to say anything you want to, but I believe uh, Larry comes to work with jokes in his hip pocket. You know, he's created the outlines. And he's already thought of things he wants to say. Right. So he says them, and we follow him, you know. It's our job to make him look good. In a real improv, say, in Second City, uh, nobody's supposed to make anybody else look good. They do the best they can for themselves. But our job, I think, is to follow um, Larry and say things like, come on, Larry, you can't say that. No one would do that, because that's the other side of everybody on his show is unlike uh, Larry David. And so to follow him and to help him, you just give him handles 
that would make him be able to come back with a good rejoinder. Right, more or less a straight person like their advocate to Costello. It's a little, as I'm sure it's a broad brush, but just an idea, right? The uh, And I bring that up for a moment because you mentioned Seinfeld and the team and how uh, they were, you know, a great team. And you were a team with Bob Caliban, I'm sure many other people on stage. I'm wondering, because uh, we don't see in the comedy clubs and in the movies, we do see it on television, we don't see comedy teams per se anymore. Oh, that's you, gone out of fashion. Do you think it's just because of that, or do you think it's too hard, or is it because vaudeville doesn't exist anymore? Or what do you think the reason is you don't see, let's say, the two, two-person comedy team you know, uh, anymore? I don't know. It ended with Martin and Lewis, and maybe the advertisement for it to other guys who might want to be a team is saying, well, look what happened to Martin and Lewis. They ended up hating each other. Right. And even but happened Lou Costello ended up not liking each other. Right, right. So and, uh, <clears throat> it's an interesting story about Abbott and Costello. When they were doing night, they were doing vaudeville, they were doing um, burlesque, and the split was 60-40, giving the straight man the most money. That was common in burlesque, because the straight man would also act as the booker, and he would go out at the end of the show and count the money in the box office. So the comic was 40% of the salary, and the other guy was 60. Then he became popular in nightclubs, and it was still 60-40 for a long time. And uh, then he finally went to Hollywood, and they got two, instead of the same lawyer, they got two lawyers. And they, they said, okay, we're going to make it more fair. But Epps is okay, 50-50. Costello's lawyer said, no, from now on, 60-40 in favor of Lou Costello. Yeah. So they say that when he slapped him, which was frequent, there was a little bit too much of a sting in it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I did hear that, and I also heard... On the other hand, they, you know, there's a love-hate there, because there was... Uh, of course, they needed each other, especially in the beginning. Uh, I think Luke Costello didn't believe he needed uh, Abbott uh, towards the end. But... Um, you know, Abbott had the the uh, what do you call that the, the physical condition that he couldn't drive a car. He was uh, uh, he had to be punched every so often to get out of this um, uh, epilepsy he had. And so you'll I didn't know that. yeah you'll see sometimes where Lou will hit. Uh, especially they said it happened a lot on stage more than anywhere else. I could see it on film, but he would hit him to to get him out of the epileptic seizure, and he could never wow, drive. I, I never knew that. I, I yeah. read a whole book on. Uh, uh, on Lou, it says Lou's on first. It was written by Costello. The daughter, right? You know, a little bio. Yes. That's really interesting. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I could send you a clip. I'll tell you an interesting fact you probably yep. don't know. They were famous for Who's on First, and I consider it to be, as performed, one of the greatest pieces of comedy there is in terms of verbal comedy. Uh, I call it comedy music. It's as much rhythm and as much timing as it is jokes. And what's really funny about it is their rhythm. And they do it like a piece of music. Yep. However, they weren't the first to do Who's On First. It was a staple in burlesque. And it was actually created not by any of those white burlesque guys, but by a black comedy team. It's who's so, On First. Who, so interesting to me. I had heard that, but I'd never heard the name of the team. Would you, are they lost in time? Do we know who it was that uh, was? Oh, I think uh, I haven't looked it up in a long time, but I believe it's in... Uh, a book called Joe Franklin's Encyclopedia of Comedy. Okay, okay, we'll have to take a look at that. There, speak- were two, there were two or three teams that were great. One was Moran and Mack, the two Black Crows. Uh, but they worked in uh, not in vaudeville or burlesque. They weren't allowed. They worked on the Chitlin Circuit, which was Black Vaudeville. Wow, what a shame. Uh, yeah. And good things, too. I mean, at least they had a place to perform, but, I mean, what a shame they couldn't show their wares to the, the large public. You know, it just we can go down that road, right. but it's just ridiculous. But uh, And it's a shame that we don't that, that their skill has not been saved, because you wouldn't have loved to have seen the originators of that uh, perform that piece. But anyway. Um, Absolutely. You know, the other thing is, since you're a, you seem to be a historian, for sure, of comedy, I want to throw this at you, because Dave and I found, or I found, a comedy team that I don't think they're that, that great, but uh, they're lost in time in that in the 30s, they saved from what I understand, I think it was RKO just like Abbott Costello did in the 40s for Universal, and they were very popular from what I understand, and we had a writer on that wrote a book about them and I just thought it was amazing that you never hear of, ever what's called a, the comedy team of Wheeler and Woolsey, have you ever heard of them? What's their names? Wheeler and Woolsey Oh, of 
course they know all about them. Oh, great. Well, let me ask you a question then. Maybe you could expand. But my basic premise is I just think it's I feel like I'm from the Twilight Zone in that my grandfather, when I was growing up, let's say, and he was around the 60s and 70s, I could have asked him about Wheeler and Woolsey. And he probably, from my, from my research, is it correct me if I'm wrong, would have known him or them for sure, because my grandfather was born in 1901, um, so he was in his 30s and the 30s, uh, would have known them as if he known many other uh, Lionel Barrymore and any other very popular performers in that day. But meanwhile, to this day, to me, and I'm a, I love all this stuff, they just came out of the blue and are sort of a lost art. Does that make any sense? I it almost feel like it's a Twilight Zone, like there was a whole group that I never heard of before. Their reputation hasn't held up. They were pretty big in vaudeville. Unfortunately, we're going to have to take a break, but we'll be back right after this with Paul Dooley, America's favorite dad. Out of the old zoo again. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Hi, this is Manny Cotto, a creator, executive producer, and showrunner of the new Fox show Next, premiering October 6th. And this is Everything Old is New Again, Douglas Viviana and David Cohen. Hi, my name is Michael Elias. I'm on Everything Old is New Again, and I'm really happy to be here and talk about my novel, You Can Go Home Now, a feminist thriller, if you will, about revenge, women in a battered women's shelter, and a detective who's trying to solve a series of crimes and my love for uh, radio. I was raised on it, and it's really a, a thrill and an honor to be on your show. So thanks a lot. How about that? Everything old is new again here, introducing uh, you to a few of the guests that we've had in the past. Uh, Paul Dooley is with us this week, and we're continuing a terrific discussion. Uh, I saw them in the Sullivan Show. Uh, his partner, uh, Bert Wheeler, lived longer, but his right. partner died a little before, but I right. saw them once with the team and a few times with another partner on the, on the Sullivan Show. They did a routine which was called uh, My Dog Just Had Pups and a guy teaching the other guy a joke. And it was so hilarious. I only saw it once. I immediately sat down and from memory I wrote the scene. It's about a two minute sketch. And I've done it tons and tons and tons of times with other partners, other places just because it's something I memorized. A guy teaching another guy how to tell a joke, and it is really, really, really funny. And that was Burt Wheeler, and and uh, I, just, I forget his partner's first name. Uh, yeah, I don't have the top of my head, but you're right, yeah. Wheeler and Woolsey. And- anyway, they fell out of favor, and uh, they didn't, and didn't. The films don't hold up. You see the films, it's full of wisecracks, but somehow it doesn't hold up to the masters, you know, of the screen, well, even to Abbott and Costello. Right, because what I understand is that a lot of what they did were wordplay, but double entendre with some, you know, dirty sexuality, whatever. And we didn't, in today's world, when we're hearing them say some of these things, it goes over our head. We don't even understand what yeah. they're saying, you it, know? It doesn't hold up. It doesn't hold up with modern audiences. But back in the day, but, I'm confirming no, they, they, they were tremendous back in the day, right? People were very popular with, or they were popular with people, correct? They were, and I have that book about them, and... It pain, painstakingly, even boringly, goes through all of their plots of their movies. Yes. You know, it's, it's much more like a dictionary than it is anything else. <laughs> is. But, but I know them very, very well. And I know about Bobby Clark, a stage comedian right. I never saw live. I was a huge fan of Bort Lahr in his vaudeville act, called his cop act he did with his wife. I saw him once do it in New York when there's about a benefit although he's no longer in vaudeville then, but he just did his famous cop act at a benefit with uh, Ethel Merman and a ton of Broadway stars raising money. And I'm a huge fan of his. He's a wonderful, wonderful actor. How about that? That's great, great, com- great comedian. Uh, amazing. And I guess finally, just to talk about, just for a moment, Gary Marshall, uh, because I'm imagining... And I'm not sure if I'm sure if I'm right about this, but that he was a fan of comedy that came before him, wherein he learned a lot of lessons and uh, was able to then, you know, kind of build upon the the, the past to do the odd couple. Oh, and show, yeah. You know, he, and, he wrote for comedians before he ever wrote a movie or anything like that. 
Right. Uh, he lived in New York. Uh, I forget the name of the comedian. He's uh, he's a nightclub comedian, a Catskill comedian, and he uh, spoke with a Brooklyn accent. Oh, he appeared in uh, he appeared in um, Happy Days, I think, maybe as a uh, owner of a cafe. Okay. Um, I forget his name, but he had a, a strong Brooklyn accent. So. Yeah. Gary had a partner, and they wrote comedy for comedians. And they used to go to his apartment across the Hudson River from New York to Fort Lee, New Jersey, to his home look, overlooking the river. And they would go there, and he would talk to them about topics and what he wanted them to write. And they would stay there and write while he, he uh, says, so I'm going to take a nap. Wake me when it's funny. <laughs> that was the name of the name of Gary Marshall's first book, Wake Me When It's Funny. And what was it like to work with him? He had to have a smile. It seemed like he was one of these guys oh, that, you know. Great, great guy, wonderful guy. He did something I never heard a film director do or even a TV director do. He had two guys on the set who were just hang, hanging on there, and they were writers from his shows like uh, Happy Days or whatever. You know, because by that time, he'd done tons of sitcoms very successfully. He would have a couple of these writers on staff, and they're there with him. And after take, he would go over to them and say, give me something to the end. This last line isn't working. And on the <laughs> spot, they would come up with endings. And he would just snap his fingers and say, and they came over to him and said, fix that in the middle where they say this. Make that go from this to this, but, uh, you know, give me something. And he did that because that's what he did on the sets of his sitcoms. Right, right. It was so funny. What so a comedy funny. mind. But he also seemed like, let me put it this way, you've done uh, comedy and drama and so forth, but with respect to comedy, um, you know, I, it's hard. You have to be serious about it, but you have to be have a sense of fun at the same time. Otherwise, you lose oh, course, what you're yeah. doing. But how do you be serious and funny at the same time? I, I, David, I try to do some things. We do characters here, and we improv here, and we have some fun. We do Sherlock Holmes and and Watson, and Watson's upset at Holmes because uh, in our take of it, you know, Watson's the one that's really giving the smart one, and and Holmes is just a great uh, PR guy, and and they yeah. have the interaction, whatever. So, but my point is, we have a lot of it's a very very small scale, but we have some. We could see it. We could see the fun you have creating these things, creating the improv, but also that you need to have a relationship with the other person and you need to have um, a sense of, I'm not doing this for fun or to be funny, I'm doing this to just have some fun with it and maybe some comedy, comedy will come out of it, but what I'm trying to get to is, it seems like, I, I'm just guessing like this Gary Marshall had that where the set was still fun I don't know if Woody Allen's oh, yeah. set is fun, fun you know? A lot of fun And, and But there but are other people Yeah, go ahead. Once between takes and the uh, Runaway Bride, between takes, I was juggling oranges. We were in a kitchen. And he said, put it in the next scene. It had no place in the scene. I'm Julie Roberts' father. She comes in the kitchen. I'm juggling oranges just because I could do it. Right, exactly. And, 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 it didn't mean anything. But it adds... He's like that. He's, he's a wonderful guy, very charming. He has a theater a block from my house, a Gary Marshall Theater. A legitimate that? theater. He's passed away now. Right. I did a couple of plays there, one with Klugman and Charlie Durning, and, and uh, I went to see all those plays, and it's just around the corner from my house, you know, here in Burbank. Well, I was going to say you should should write a book, and I'm hearing that you are writing a book, and you did a one-man show uh, of your life, and uh, and that must have been, we talked about it off the air, but it must have been a, a blast to, to do that. Um, oh, yeah. I, I looked in the audience one night, the second night of the show, and Dick Van Dyke's in the front row. <laughs> Afterwards, I went out and said hello, and I said, how did you even know about this little show? It was in, in a Hollywood Fringe Festival. It wasn't even that advertised. He said, oh, I've been a fan of yours for years. And then he gave me a quote, which we put on our poster in, in our program, something about Dooley's really. A lot of people think they have a sense of humor. Dooley's really got it, you know. Isn't that something? <laughs> you, you, he said, yeah, I, would li I would listen to him read the phone book. And you wouldn't, uh, like, you know, in, in your dressing room, who would know? Like, you, you wouldn't know that that's what others are thinking about you, and that's uh, that's got to be so rewarding. Uh, just as oh, playing... Oh, yeah, uh, you run into somebody much more well-known than you who know your career. Like, I met Travolta and on uh, <clears throat> um, Hairspray. Right. And we were talking, and he said, are you kidding? When I was 17, came over from New Jersey to try to get on the Broadway stage, you were already well-known. You were, it's not that you were in movies, but you were in every commercial I looked at, and you were doing a lot of humor in your commercials. And I heard your voice on the radio. So he said, I looked up to you when I was 17, and here he's a huge star. 
That's that's unbelievable. That's, that's always fun. That's terrific. Uh, just one little bit about the stage. I just want to finish off with uh, Casey Stingle. We mentioned uh, I did off the top of my head just a little bit back. Uh, we talked about you know uh, sports a little bit there, and and and, uh, and and I just thought it was interesting that you've done a one man show uh, that played Casey Stingle. I'm a little kid. My granddad brings um, a signature to me, you know, from Florida when he went down to visit, came back. This has got to be 1969 or something like that, 65, I don't know. And uh, No, maybe 69, 70. And it's Casey Stingle. And he was so impressed and he was so happy that he had gotten this. Little kid that I was, you know, I don't know who this fella is, and I, I still have it, but I just put it aside. It meant nothing to me at the time. It means a lot to me now. Uh, of course, well, you, you can sell a, a signature like that. I would think so, and I would never. I, even my grandfather actually also met, uh, we're going back here, Babe Ruth when he opened the park around here, and I have a, an old, old softball with Babe Ruth's autograph on it. Uh, but um, be that as it may, the, the, the point is that you played Casey uh, on yeah. stage, and that must yeah. have been you know, a unique experience. Tell us a smidge about, about that. Uh, one of the things I did on stage, I... I wore different uniforms and I underdressed and I'd have one baseball uniform under another one. I'd have two or three changes, like a jacket or a... T- and the striped pants stayed the same, but I would, in the business, in the actual show, in front of the audience, I would take off one jacket from the Mets and hang it up on a hook. Now I'd have one, one from the Yankees <laughs> or the Dodgers. <laughs> right. So that's one of the ways we, we did it. And only once on opening night, I forgot a line. But there was a line in the show that said, uh, there are 125 bathrooms in Yankee Stadium. I forget the number. But there was a line like that, the real number. And I need one right now. That's one of the lines in the show. <laughs> but uh, uh, when I went up into my lines and couldn't think of the next section, I just walked up. I used that line from another place, saying, and i got to find one right now. I walked off the stage, looked at the stage manager's book, got the line, he pointed it out, came back, and that was the only line I forgot, and he gave it to me, but I used another line from another part of it to get there. Right. Uh, that's that's real thinking on your feet, that's for sure. And yeah. probably the audience probably didn't even know what you did because it fit in seamlessly, you know? Uh, it sounds like that anyway. And All right, and we'll be back. I'm sorry we have to cut into this just for a moment. We'll be back right after this and everything old is new again with Paul Dooley. We're talking uh, about all kinds of things that are just running the gambit from this gentleman who has so much to share with us, such a history in theater and, of course, movies and television. We'll be back right after this and everything old is new again with Paul Dooley. Now, back to America's Entertainment Pop Culture Talk Show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. And unfortunately, David Cohen's not here right now, but we have been hosting Paul Dooley uh, on Everything Old is New Again for the past two weeks and having a fantastic time right here on Everything Old is New Again. Along those lines, though, that must have been some show because that man did not speak easily, so to speak. He didn't, you know, he, his, his ter- he was almost a Yogi Berra-ish, you know, where he said these things and you really kind of had to think about what is he saying and is he answering this question straightforward or is he just avoiding you and <laughs> what? Uh, but so the lines weren't like just straight. Like they, you had to really, I think, study probably to learn all of those uh, malaprosm problems. What they call it. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I had known about him, and I'd heard some of those malaprop things. There was a guy named Marv, Marv, somebody who was not a very, uh, not the hottest guy in the team. But he said Marvin Throneberry, I think is that right. Was. Yes. One of our lines was, uh, "I have the same birthday as Marv Throneberry," and uh, after. Uh, they gave me my cake, the team. So I thought of giving him a cake, but I was afraid he'd drop it. <laughs> <laughs> One night we had all the Casey, all of his, all of his players who were still alive in the audience. There may be forty of them. They must have been the ones, laughing. The, the ones the ones that hadn't died off, you know. Right. But boy, they loved that night. And my reviews were things like um, I was putting my reviews in my book. A few reviews of Casey. It says Dooley. Uh, <clears throat> Dooley 
you playing Casey a role that fits him like a glove. <laughs> and a lot of Sports Illustrated had a few lines, but they were always kind of things about one guy. So I bet my old uh, Babe Ruth uh, baseball that uh, nobody can impersonate Casey like Dooley. He's magnificent. How about that? <laughs> uh, it's too bad in some ways that we, you know, we don't have... Uh, you know, all of that uh, available to us, you know, filmed all the time. Because f- up till recently, I don't think they filmed much, if anything, on Broadway. Because there was That's a fear, right. you know, a fear of that getting out and then people not going. I guess. So yeah, um, we would have loved to have seen that. But uh, again, uh, Paul Dooley, thank you so much for spending so much time with us uh, on Everything Old Is New Again. We really had a great time. Uh, you have a tremendous career, so much to tell us. We're very much looking forward to this book that is rumored that you're. you're you're working on now and we're very happy to have you back should you uh, you like to um it's been a, a true pleasure thank you so much thank you and listen uh, if you want call me back in a year and we'll do some more i'll be happy to do that we'll definitely do that we'll be here and uh and you'll be there and we're, we're gonna just really uh, enjoy uh, it, how do i say this just rec- like a you're a, a raconteur we have so much to talk about and and so little time so again thank you so much Everything old is new again. We'll be back next week talking all things entertainment, pop culture. David Cohen will return. So in the short way, uh, we'll just say we'll be back right at this. Everything old is new again. There we go, Paul. I did uh, extend a little bit here. I probably can get two shows out of that. I apologize, but it was just going. I didn't want to end, so I apologize for taking a little bit more of your time than we expected, you know? That's okay. I don't mind. What am I doing? I'm sitting at home. <laughs> oh, you should have said that. I would have gone another hour with you. <laughs> but, but no. <laughs> no, I'm... Uh... I only started writing this book because I said, what the hell am I going to do? I might be quarantined here for a year or two. You know, we don't so know. I, yeah, it's... Day, I, I write three or four hours a day, and then I... I get uh, my wife's assistant, who's uh, still working with us remotely, right? To uh, type them up and bring them over to me. Why not? You I know, don't a, I don't type. I don't have a computer. So you used to write longhand then, all your, your scripts and so forth. You know, the the performances on uh, on on. Uh... I, I actually did, and I had a sec at the electric company. I had a secretary, and just for your information, one of the real reasons I got to be the head writer was that. Just because of a proclivity for making uh, funny names or funny characters, uh, I made up four or five characters, and pretty soon the, the producers of the electric company said, wait a minute, this guy has so many great ideas, we have to put him in charge of the scripts. <laughs> One was a guy named Fargo North, comma, decoder, a guy who decoded sentences for the kids. <laughs> Another one was uh, child chef Julia Grownup, about <laughs> Julia Child. I made a thing called uh, Easy Reader. A guy, uh, be, uh, he was a junkie for reading, and it was it was Morgan Freeman, and he played uh, like a guy from uh, Easy Rider. He was Easy Reader. How about that? Uh, I tell you, I I'm 58. I made up a dozen characters like this, and they became the the cast of the show. You know. And then at the left, they, they continued, correct? Yeah. Yeah. See that? Um, well, it went on for six years. Right. As I, I was, I'm 58. We get whatever time frame we hear. I do remember that show for sure. Growing up, was a fave. I was not a big fan of uh, Sesame Street, and I just thought that was like more or less a, uh, in, in today's vernacular, a, a, a Saturday Night Live for for kids. You know the, the the different skits and the Bill Cosby and the different people you had on there. It was just uh, really uh, ahead of his time and totally different type of show. Well, what happened was, uh, we were told, uh, he said, you have to be absolutely 100% different from Sesame Street because we don't want an eight-year-old learning to read or a seven-year-old looking at us and saying, oh, this just is more Sesame Street. That's for my little brother. I'm not going to watch that. So we had to disguise it away from the Muppets. They weren't allowed to use the Muppets. Right. But a lot of people could have done it, but you, you did it. You know, in such a creative way. Maybe I guess I guess we're thinking that you brought uh, some of your stage uh, performances beforehand to the to the table. I guess your experiences to, to the skits and the commercials and so forth. I don't know that you were doing I'll before. I'll tell you an interesting. The way I approached it was this: among the uh, lessons we were given by the experts, we got a crash course in how to teach reading from tre- from teachers or teachers of teachers. 
And they said, here's something else we'd like you to address. There's a percentage of the population, that's say 5 or 10%, who never learn to read. They're illiterate. If you can make your comedy and your scenes and your sketches and your blackouts interesting enough and clever enough that they would entertain adults, they might sit with their children and without ever having to go back to school at 21 years old, they could learn the basics of reading without any embarrassment. They could learn to read if they followed the teachings of our thing. So I tried to make it entertain gen- children and uh, adults as well for that reason. That's and actually so there was a certain satiric hipness to it. Right. Cleverness, you know. I mean, that's actually I genius. I guy who was a crank caller, and I named him J. Arthur Crank based on J. Arthur Rank. <laughs> now, I knew that, no, that none of the kids would know that the producer in England was J. Arthur Rank, but it was a silly name anyway. Right. J. Arthur Crank. But what a I great... a lot of things that would be picked up on sometimes by grown-ups and uh, sometimes not, but, but they would try to entertain them a little bit. And it had more of a satire, satiric slant to it than, than uh, a lot of kids' shows. They always, most people talk down to kids. I tried to talk above them and let them rise up to the level that I was writing a comedy at. But it worked because uh, uh, they loved these characters. They loved Fargo North. They were smarter than him. Right. We made him into an idiot. I based him on Inspector Clouseau okay. in uh, the Pink Panther movies. Right. A guy pretending to be a hotshot who didn't know anything, and the kids would pipe up and say something to solve his problem. So, uh, little little Don Knotts there too, so to speak, when he gets into that that mode, you know, when he knows says he knows what he's doing and he really does it. Um, yeah. And I'll tell you, it it, it lasted, and it, it, it's it's got to be a nice feeling. And I'll let you go in a minute, but it's got to be a nice feeling for you to feel that um, you contributed to that and helped in six seven years. You could say a generation of people um, to try to yeah, overcome. They had reruns too for a long time. Right. Exactly. So at least ten years on the air, if not longer. And and what a. I, uh, I uh, I left after the first year to go back to acting because I it, it's more fun to create something than to to maintain it like a factory work like a factory job right but to create something like that that was able to the foundation the skeleton was there in such a way and done so well that they could create and continue the show with the same kind of themes and the same kind of ideas that you laid out and to help other people like that it's got to be a nice feeling a nice legacy that even if you, if, you know even if it's just one person or one dad that or, or whoever was watching with their son and, and and learned a little bit from it as well it's sort of like they do now in the uh, the animation I, I i see this a lot in in the animation where they're making these movies not just for the kids there's double entendre or whatever it might be messages cer- certainly social messages and or even like that well, in, look, look yeah. at the simpsons right 30 years entertaining to grown-ups and children exactly and that's that the is a pictures, talent the pictures are more for the children than the, the stupidity is the, for the children but the, the references are incredibly adult many of them exactly they're doing parodies of the beatles they're doing parodies of uh uh, Orson Welles' first movie, you know, yeah. The Citizen Kane. Absolutely. My daughter said to me something about, uh, and I knew it's based on Citizen Kane. I said, how do you know that? She says, I saw it on Tiny Toons, where these rabbits, uh, where these characters are the sons of Bugs Bunny and Porky Pig. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny Toons. She learned. I heard her saying something about... Scarlett O'Hara, you know, she was doing a little impression at seven years old. Right. Oh, my dear, I'm getting the vapors my gentleman called us have left. <laughs> I said, how the hell do you know that? She said, it's on Tiny Toons. <laughs> so they do parodies. And, and all the kids' shows are the most successful animation shows and films are for adults and children, cars even. Oh, but we're out of time with Paul Dooley. Paul, thank you so much for being with us. Come on back. Next section, we're going to share a little insights with Richard Kind. Right after this, everything goes new again. <laughs> This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Uh, We're going to shift gears here for one moment. uh, And for this section, we are going to revisit with a guest we had in the past. His name, uh, you know, his face, you know. 
His voice, you know, Richard Kind. You know, we at Everything Old is New Again, as we know, uh, celebrate, our listeners know, celebrate the entertainment of the past, and, and we know that it serves as the foundation of what we do today. First, I guess, we'll, just a, a basic question. Uh, we'll see. Do you believe that that is somewhat a, a, a postulation that is true? And if so, what have or did affect you when grow- you were growing up and growing into this profession that serves as somewhat of the foundation of what you do now? First of all, I agree with you totally, which is why I celebrate uh, shows like this and this show. Uh, I th- Look, you study history. Why? Because you've got to see what came before so that you know how to act while you're living the life now. You read books. You st- they still read Jane Austen. They still read Charles Dickens. Why? Because there is a history, and you have to see how things evolve. I feel the same way about movies and a lot, a lot about TV shows. I have three kids. All my, I, I try and show them the old movies. I try and show them Hitchcock. I show them Capra. I show them Preston Sturges. Sometimes I see why they don't like them. They really hate black and white. But it is essential to know what the history of entertainment is so that you can watch Avengers and know what what came before it or how did it get there. And I think it's like it's history. And I think you are the better person for it. It's how I was raised, and I was raised going, my grandparents lived on East 69th Street in the city. They used to take me to theater all the time, and then I used to just go by myself when I got a little older. Uh, I lived in uh, in Pennsylvania, but it was an hour hour trip to New York. I it's it's just I, I, it is essential that that people be learned or and remember the past because it impacts the present. Thank you, and I appreciate that because that's exactly what we. Uh, it couldn't have been said better. It's exactly what we stand for. Well, based upon that, is this something uh-huh. that you look back upon in in character actors? Maybe someone uh, that that you've uh, seen and admired doing this uh, profession before, or is this something in acting in general? Uh, someone that well, you lend when I, some. When I was yeah. young, when I was young, my heroes were Woody Allen, Spencer Tracy, W. C. Fields. Uh, you know, and I, I loved. Watching the, those movies, I remember when uh, when they were talking about like Dustin Hoffman, like like the, the world of the character actor, uh, and they were up against John Wayne for the Academy Award for Midnight Cowboy, and uh, they lost to John Wayne doing True Grit. And you you and, and of course I was aware of what American lore was and who John Wayne was, but I really did look at Dustin Hoffman even though I was a young kid and, and, and couldn't really understand Midnight Cowboy. But these were the things that I loved. I, I, a movie that I always hawk is uh, Witness for the Prosecution, mm-hmm. uh, where everybody, even the leading actor, of course, Charles Lawton, but Marlena Dietrich, a leading lady, Tyrone Power, a leading man, were character actors. That, that one kills me. I love Witness for the Prosecution. The movie that really did it for me was, uh, was M.A.S.H., uh, Mass taught me a lot about everything. It taught me about irony. It taught me about uh, camaraderie amongst guys, about taking life seriously, but don't take yourself seriously. It taught me about, I mean, Elliot Gould and George Siegel. They were my heroes when I was growing up. Right. I wanted to be, I wanted to be Elliot Gould. And, uh, and then when I meet him, and at one point I'm in the same room we're going to have, we're in the waiting room to audition for the same role. What the f- <laughs> is going on here? Right. That's crazy. And it's so in, it's so inspirational, too, in that you, the generic you, can come from anywhere doing anything. And if you aspire to do something and have a modicum of talent and look at the past and learn from others, uh, you can achieve something that you like to do. I didn't start this show till I was, I'm going to say, 52 years old. But I never forgot uh, the past. I never forgot the foundation of Bob and Ray and of uh, Gene Shepard. Oh, people that I loved, you know, and that... Oh, yeah, well, that, 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 that's how I listen to. My grandfather took me to see Bob and Ray on Broadway, oh. the two and only. I saw Bob and Ray live, and who would have thought that I'd be acting with his granddaughter? And, and uh, it, was, it was nuts. And we would talk about him. She would talk about him because she knew him. You know, he only passed uh, yeah. uh, 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 a little while ago. Yeah, I, I, yeah very important. And now that I'm old, life is much shorter than you ever realize. So uh, even though we're looking at the past, it ain't that long ago. 
Right. But when I think that Second City was 20, uh, not Second City, uh, um, Spit City was 20, over 20 years ago, it seems like yesterday. Yes, it's amazing how time flies. And so, therefore, my point would be, and I think your point is, uh, if you have the drive and inspiration to do something, there's something inside of you that's dragging you you know, in a certain direction or, or, or there's a light ahead, and you're saying, I want to do the radio, I want to do theater, or I want to be a scientist, or I want to be a lawyer, whatever it might be, uh, let's not ignore that. Let's, uh, let's feed that, because that's where true happiness is. I'm truly happy on the radio, I, you know, that I kind agree. of thing. Yeah, I got I got. I got. I do agree with you that you must follow your dream. However, sometimes you're deluding yourself. Yes. It would be wonderful to be an actor, but if you don't have it, then then you're stuck being a very, in right. essence, a winner. Okay. And it's it's very difficult if you want a, a life now. I find that agents and producers, TV producers, were former actors who, at age 28, said, "What am I doing?" I want kids, I want a big house, and they went off and they did what they actually were good at, but, but they're, they're, the conduit to that career was through acting. But try it out. That's how I did it. My, uh, my dad's best friend said, try acting, you love it, give it a shot. I say, do your dream. What I really say is, go make a lot of money. Go into business, go do whatever it is, make a lot of money, and then open your own theater. And if you really like acting, you could you could be 300 pounds and, and play brick and cat on a hot tin roof <laughs> because you're paying for it. Exactly. So go and make a lot of money and live your dream because if you want to be a star, if that's your dream, stop right now. You're not going to be a star. There are maybe 16 stars who get paid over a million dollars per movie project, Okay. 16 people, maybe, you can right, name. Right. So don't think that you're going to be famous or a star. If you want to be an actor, there are lots of ways to be an actor. Right, and backing that off, exactly right, And but backing that off a smidge. Well, let me just say, you know, I and all of, a lot of our listeners have kids, and in, these, in this day and age, it's so interesting that it's no longer just, hey, kids, go, out, go outside, play the sports, come back in when the lamplight comes on, so to speak. There's um, more options. There are theaters, local theaters everywhere. There's a lots of plays in school, of course, but beyond that, there's local theaters everywhere that are giving kids the opportunity to try this. I'm not saying everyone should be an actor. I agree 100. percent But but if you've got a, you know the inspiration, if you got uh, and I a drive to do something like this, it could at least give you some skills at a young age that maybe you use as a presenter. Uh, you know, in, in the business world, when you're public speaking in business, uh, it's you not are right. A hundred percent right about what you just said. It will make you a better person. It will make you a a, a broader and better citizen because you get to look at characters and what drives a character. You get to work with other people and interact in ways that you never thought that you would. And you get to play pretend. And playing pretend keeps you young. And it gives you an energy that just sitting at home and watching YouTube or TikTok, which I love, but as long as you do something else, go out and try it. It's a blast. You know, when you see two little kids in the playground playing for cowboys and Indians, they're, they're playing pretend, and, and they look so joyous. And then it stops. It stops. You grow up, and that enjoyment stops. So go and continue to play pretend. It'll keep you young, and it's a blast. It's I, a blast. It's great. I agree. It also gives you, besides sports doing this, it gives the idea of what it's like to be part of a, a larger production or a team, if you will. Ah. You know, yes. it also gives you the idea of let me have some empathy or at least understand where someone else is coming from. Where I think in this world, because people can hide behind the computer and and unfriend someone just unceremoniously or whatever, uh, say nasty things on the computer. Uh, when you have empathy for the other person, at least understand what's motivating them and where they're coming from. I think you could certainly have a better understanding of social interaction and uh, and be a well well rounded person if that makes sense. I, I, you, I totally, totally agree. The Internet is a magnificent invention and the worst thing to happen. 
to our social community. We've had a tremendous time with uh, Richard Kind. Richard, I just wanted to thank you so much for spending time with us. So we're not just looking back at the past and saying that's the greatest time back then, period. We're looking back and saying this is just the foundation of what we can build upon now, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Our greatest filmmakers all are are well, well aware of what came before them. You know, Spielberg famously looked at uh, at uh, the searchers. Right. In, in so many of his Star Wars, uh, not, 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 not Spielberg, uh, not Star Wars, Lucas, right. of, uh, of those images that are iconic, that came before us, and, can, and actually can be approved upon in, in ways. But of course we're all influenced. Hell, we're, it, the, the first five years, three years, five years of our lives are influenced by our parents. We can't get rid of them. That's <laughs> who we are. So why not get the parents of, uh, of cinema? It's, it's what I love. If I, they knew my name, I'm not doing my job. Well, the problem is after this show, you will. Now you're going to be, a, a, you know, <laughs> recognized for your voice from everything old as new again. Thank you again, Richard Kind, for being with us. We certainly appreciate your time. Wish you all the best and hope to have you back sometime in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Come on back next week through everything old as new again. Continue more things, more discussions, all things entertainment, pop culture. Everything old is new again. I'm twisted up inside, but nonetheless I feel the need to stay. You've been listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's pop culture entertainment talk show. Find us on the web at everythingoldisnewagain.biz. That's dot biz. See you next week. Same bad time, same bad station.